Uh, I want to let you know something awesome that happened this week uh, that hasn't happened in years, which is uh, Pastor Scott actually went to work out with me, which is amazing, which is really, really amazing. In fact, uh, we went to work out, and we worked so hard. I picked him up in the morning, took him to the gym, came back. He was so sore. He's like, I don't think I could do another workout for another year. I said, hey, let's go tomorrow morning. And so let's work out on top of your soreness so that you could be sore anew. So let's do that, right? And so he's like, please, please, I could work out anything else except my legs. You see, legs are things that you work out not because you want it, but because you need it. Amen? That's what it means. It's like you can work out your biceps and your abs and your chest and do all that stuff. And that's all for show. But what really counts is your legs. So I looked up the next day's workout and sure enough, it was leg day again. And so leg day, leg day, leg day. That means it's not so much what you want, but it's something that you need. And today is spiritual leg day. Today is going to be hard work. It's not going to be easy. It's not what you want, but it's what you need. And so I pray that you be ready to receive the leg day and that the word of God will speak to you in a mighty way. Now, if you come to my office, you'll see immediately there are four black and white portraits, guys that I admire, guys that inspire me. One is my favorite philosopher, that is C.S. Lewis. Then comes my favorite preacher, that's Charles Spurgeon. Then comes my favorite missionary, that's Adoniram Judson. And lastly is my favorite theologian, that's John Calvin. Now, John Calvin is the first modern expositor of the Bible. In fact, he wrote the, a commentary that addresses every single word, pretty much, of the entire Bible. He was an incredible scholar, and he's still so relevant today. Revolutionized the Reformation doctrine. Now, listen, um, um, he did that. And he wrote these commentaries that were like through in great scholarship all the way from Genesis all the way on, except he just left one book out. Do you know the one book that he didn't write a commentary to? Revelation. Revelation. The story goes like this. When people asked, hey, uh, why didn't you write a book on uh, Revelation? And he said, because I don't get it. That's what he said. <laughs> And here's why, because when you write a commentary, it means you have to go through word for word and just interpret and say, what does this really mean? How, how, what is this really saying? And sometimes when we look at the tree for too long, then we get lost in the forest. Sometimes we need to back away from scripture and see the forest itself, then it starts becoming utterly clear. And one thing that is clear about the book of Revelation, even though we might be so confused, is this, that it really is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about him being exalted. It's him being glorified. It is a picture of Jesus that we've never seen before. And as I said last week, John wrote this while people were persecuted. Emperor Nero, then after Emperor Domitian, mass persecution to the Christians. And so these Christians were imprisoned, and they were um, about to get thrown into the lions or, or to be burned at the stakes. And so Jesus comes, and through a great vision given to John, says, give these uh, letters to the churches. Give these to the people that are in prison, the ones that are suffering. Now, what do they need to hear in order for them to be alleviated from their suffering? Imagine if you are suffering in prison, you're about to get thrown into the lions and to be eaten, and all of a sudden you open this letter and it says things about lampstands and seven spirits and all these other symbols and, and, and the scrolls and the stars and it gives you the interpretation of them. Do you think that would have helped you at the moment? And the answer is no, it wouldn't have helped you. You see, this book is primarily about the glory and the exalted Christ, the kind of Christ that we cannot imagine, the ones that have, the Christ that has fiery eyes is to tell us that he sees them all. With a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth is to say that his words are sharper and can penetrate any hardened heart. He says that he has a voice of roaring water as to be under all the waterfalls of the world to say that he is absolutely powerful. And here, this exalted Christ gives a stern warning to 
Seven churches in Revelation basically representing all churches. And up until now, Jesus has talked to four of the seven churches, and we're looking at the fifth church. Interestingly, every church that he talked to up until now, he gave accommodation, meaning attaboy, you did good. And on the other end, he said, but you need to fix this. Up until he comes to the church of Sardis. Because when he addresses Sardis, there's zero commendation. There's not a word of attaboy. It's like you're in trouble. And more than you and I would like to admit, Sardis is just like our church. We're more in trouble than you and I realize. And it is by our humble posture and it is by God's grace that he would reveal some of these things to us so that we would not fall to our own demise. And so let's humbly ask the Lord to teach us this morning from his word. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Please turn to Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to read the first six verses describing uh, a message that Jesus gives to the church of Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If you don't have a Bible, I urge you to grab one uh, from the people who are passing uh, these Bibles in the aisles. And go ahead and grab one. Turn to the last book of the Bible. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If you're there already with me, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word if you're able. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your work complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy." The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear, and what the Spirit says to the churches. That is the word of the Lord for this great morning, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Here's a question. What does it look like to have a reputation of being spiritually alive, but actually dead? What does that look like in you, to be spiritually alive in only reputation, but inside you're actually dead? What does that look like for the church? What does that look like for a city? Uh, Michael Horton wrote in a book, Christless Christianity, he asked a perplexing question. He says, what would it look like if Satan actually took over a city? Satan taking over. Now, could you imagine? Just imagine for a minute. What if Satan took over the Bay Area? What would that look like? Okay? Now, in your imagination, maybe it looks like total mayhem to massive scale, massive violence, a sexually licentious culture, drugs in every corner, prostitution in every block, churches all closed down. But Donald Gray Barnhouse, a pastor who pastored about 50 years ago in a great church called 10th Presbyterian Church, has a different perspective. He went on radio and CBS, and he gave us a different picture of what it looks like if Satan actually took over your city. He says this, all the bars will be closed, pornography banished, Pristine streets would be filled with tidy pedestrians who smiled at each other. There'd be no swearing. Children would say, yes, sir, and no, ma'am. And the churches would be full every Sunday where Christ is not preached. Churches would be full where Christ would not be preached. And that is a picture of Satan reigning over a city. And this is certainly Sardis, a church with the reputation of being alive, but they're actually dead. It's like washing a cup only on the outside, but the inside has mold, it has nasty things inside, vile, 
and it could get you sick. And now truth be told, most of us, most of us long for a city that has clean streets, right? Absence of pornography, people who have manners. We long for a city where we could go to Costco and there are only six people in there. That's like a dream, right? Lord, let it be, right? Like, we long for a day when we go past the, you know, the free sample aisle and everybody's cordially in line, right? That everybody's taking their turn like children do, right? And that we long for a day when the carts are not bumped, that carts will have no bumpers because we don't assertively try to cut off each other because we're so polite. That's what we want. We want nostalgic Americana of the 50s, right? Yet when you hear about the part where Christ is not preaching the churches, you say, well, that's unfortunate, but at least we have a nice city. At least we have a Costco with few people. That's nice. And many of us would say, at least the church is full. At least we have decent people. And that's the dream, right? Church is full, decent people. And the Bible's answer would say, absolutely not. No, this is a city reigning with the evil one and his demons. The passage warns, about, warns us about a church with people filled with spiritually dying, spiritually on life support, and the spiritually dead. And the crazy part is, they all look alive on the outside. So much so that everybody thinks they're alive, and yet they're dead. Kind of like, perhaps, Resney Church. And this is a warning to us. And therefore, what I want to do with the remainder of our time is to identify three problems that we see in getting spiritually sick or being spiritually dead. And lastly, three things that we can do to find spiritual life. It's all in the text. If you're taking notes first, we die spiritually when we lose our spiritual reality. When you lose your spiritual reality, we see this in verse 1. Look at this. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Oh, I know your works, and you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, would you just consider in verse 1 how Jesus introduces himself to the church of Sardis? It's a little different from every church to every church, but he comes and he says, Oh, I have the seven spirits of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, good thing that this is not new. We've seen this reference that Jesus made in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. We covered it last week. He describes himself in Revelation 1, 4 as this. He says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, and this is Jesus saying, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's referring to God the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. The seven spirits, that's the question that we're trying to find the answer for. And from Jesus Christ. Now, when you read this initially, it seems like a basic Trinitarian greeting. You know, your standard Trinitarian greeting. Grace from our God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. That is a Trinitarian greeting, right? Except in this case, you see that the order's kind of mixed up. God the Father, seven spirits, then Jesus his Son. What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what's going on. This is the typical temple language that John is using. Because at the temple, you see that when he went into the Holy of Holies, he would have seen the Shekinah glory of God, the Father. That right next to it, he would have seen uh, the lampstand with seven arms on it. That's the seven spirits. And then he would have seen the altar in which John knew that Jesus went on the cross. So he's using temple language to describe the Trinitarian God. Now, the number seven is an important number because in the book of Revelation, it's always referring to fullness or completeness. That's what it's referring to. And so the seven spirits of God is the fullness of the spirit of God. So Jesus, when he introduces himself to Sardis, he's basically saying, oh, I'm the one who has the fullness and the completeness of the Spirit of God. And he says, with that fullness, I know all things and I know your deeds. I know your works. And you think you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. 
your dead. Now, when he refers to people in the church of Sardis as dead, I think he's talking about two different kinds of people. One, the spiritually dead, and second, spiritually sleeping. First, he's talking to those people who are spiritually dead, which means he's talking to non-Christians because later he'll refer to himself as him coming as a thief in the night. And every time he talks about the thief in the night, he's always talking about judgment. The final judgment will come. But he's also talking to the spiritually almost dead or spiritually sleeping because in verse 2, we hear him say, wake up. Now, if somebody's dead, you don't say to the person, wake up from your deadness. You don't do that, right? You, you do that to people who are sleeping. Dead people don't need to wake up. Dead people need to be resurrected, amen? You were dead in your transgression, but you were resurrected by the Spirit of God, amen? And so that's how you became alive. You just didn't need to be woken up. But spiritually sleepy people need to be woken up. They need to be awakened. So some are spiritually dead in this church and some are spiritually sleepy in this church. What does it mean to be spiritually asleep? It means that you and I are so disillusioned that we're so far away from what is actual or what is real just like in your real sleepiness or a state of sleep. You know, I get caught up sometimes when I'm sleeping. I talk to my wife. She says, you said that. I don't remember you saying that. No way. Right? Because you're asleep. You're not in reality. You're thinking of something else. You see? Say I'm asleep and I'm dreaming about what I always dream of, me and my family being on the beach of Hawaii. That's nice. But actually, my house is on fire. Okay? So I need to wake up. But in my dreams, I'm in Hawaii. So in my dream state, the things that are small seem really big. And things that are really big can seem really small, like fire in my house. So as I'm sleeping, you, I might hear my wife shouting at me, honey, honey, wake up, the house is on fire. And I'll say, yeah, yeah, the house is on fire. Wake me up in the morning. And I'll only say that because though I'm kind of awake, I'm mostly asleep. And though I could interact with my wife, the big things can really seem small. And small things could seem really big. And I know that in our culture, many of us are spiritually asleep because we can't see things very clearly. Because if we were to, we wouldn't get into this crazy political polarizing game that we do on social media. Because many of you think that Donald Trump is actually our savior. But at the, on the other side, many of you think Donald Trump is an antichrist. But all along, you have forgotten who actually sits on the throne of this world. You've forgotten. You know why? Because you're asleep. You think Donald Trump could save us? You think Donald Trump could wreck us? And God says, did you forget? I'm on the throne of this country. Amen? Amen. Don't get into that mess. See, you're sleepy. Here's the second thing. We die spiritually when we lean on our reputation. And boy, so many of us are. Notice it says that this church has a name that is alive. This church probably is growing, that means. It's full of activity. It has a great reputation in the community. This church is well known by being a dynamic church. It probably has a cool name. It probably has a cool logo. They probably get free donuts. You know, that kind of church. <laughs> They're growing. They're busy with many deeds. So Jesus says, I know your works. And you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. On the outside, everybody thinks you're great, but on the inside, you're dead. Now here's the question. How is Sardis dead? How are they dead? Verse 2 tells us, it says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. And Jesus says, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. 
Now, what does that mean? See, when you look at all the other messages in the six other churches that Jesus gives, you would know, it's obvious, it's referring to them not proclaiming the gospel as they ought to. But verse 5 actually confirms that because Jesus says to the church of Sardis in verse 5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, if you've ever read through the New Testament, this line right here, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels, you've heard it several times, Jesus say. Jesus says, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels, but if you deny my name, I will deny you and deny, um, deny your, myself, I mean, deny you in front of my God, my father, and my, uh, his angels. He says that over and over again. He said, oh, if you are proud of me, then I'll be proud of you. But you know, if you're ashamed of me, then, then I'll be ashamed of you. You says that over and over and over again. So why is the church's work incomplete? I'll tell you why. Because they are not confessing Christ in the middle of the culture of Sardis. Instead of sharing the gospel, they're kind of ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because they go along with the culture just to get along with the culture. See, the church just wants to be cool. The church just wants to get along with the culture. They want to be seen as likable. And they want to say, hey, man, that church is really cool, man. They're just like us, says the world. And they want that for them. They want people to like them. That's why they're not preaching the gospel. So note this church has a reputation of being alive. The church is probably growing. It has a great reputation in our city and all that, feeding the poor. But you realize there are many churches like this in our country and in the world. They say things like, man, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, so much as to what you believe as long as we make the world a better place. We just, let's just unite. It's not about doctrine. It's not even about Jesus. It's just about God's love. So let's just love each other. It doesn't matter about our distinctives. It doesn't matter what the Bible says, you know. Let's just accept one another and do a lot of good deeds and offend no one. So they avoid saying hard things that the Bible says. They get their black highlighter and just black out all the parts that seem a little offensive, you know. Instead, they're driven by their desire to be culturally relevant or striving to be accepted, offending no one obeying nothing, and they say things like, oh, God is love. God is just love, 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 love. And by being ashamed of the Bible, they don't teach the scriptures, and they have deviated from the right doctrine. They've avoided the kind of the gospel that speaks truth and love and offends at times. But listen, listen. If God cannot offend you at times, you have to realize then he's no God in your life. Let me ask you this question. Can God offend you? I hope he could because if God can't offend you, then you don't really have a God. What you think is a God is like your amicable friend that agrees to everything that you say. Hey, what do you feel like eating? Oh, I don't know. You feel like sushi? Yeah. You feel like steak? Yeah. You feel like vegetarian? Yeah. That's your God. But if you have a true God, you realize that God could come and offend you anytime. Why? Oh, because he's God and you're not. That's why he should offend you. That's why he can offend you. And do you know what happens when you preach the gospel in our culture with truth and love, not just love? Well, think about what happened to Jesus. Did Jesus preach the gospel with truth and love? Yes. What did that get him? Door number two, the cross. How about Peter? Door number one, upside down cross. How about you, P- I mean, Paul? Well, he got persecution, exile, shipwrecked, and imprisonment. What happens to a church that preaches the true doctrine of Jesus Christ? Listen, they are loved and hated at the same time. You are loved because you bring hope to a city because you're sharing the good news of the gospel, but you're hated because the gospel says that there's a king of the universe and it ain't you. It ain't you. And that means you don't get to do whatever you please or do because there's a king and if there's a king then you must submit to him. It's not anarchy, which is self-rule. It's monarchy. It's God's rule. And he sits on the throne 
And the problem with our culture today is that somehow our culture thinks that we could define our own self. That the most important value in our culture is autonomy. Autonomy, it's all about me. So don't tell me what I should call myself. I could call myself a he, I could call myself a she, I could call myself a they, or whatever I please, because it's all about me. And now when Christianity comes and says, Christianity defines who you are because God created you, you weren't you know, randomly created through a collocation of atoms binding together from infinite time, that's not what it is, then they say, how dare you infringe upon my primary value of autonomy? That's how it works. And so you will not be very much liked in our culture in some ways. But God knew that because John 15 says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it's hated you, says Jesus. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Resonate Church, Let us not ever try to strive to be the cool church or the popular church or the relevant church. Let us strive to be the church that desires deeply to exalt Christ and Christ alone, loving people, but not at the expense of being ashamed of the gospel. Amen? Let us be that. All day. Let us be that. That's our hope. So that is a message to the corporate body of Sardis, but he's also speaking to the individual as well. And the individual message is this. Many of you look spiritually alive. You've been a Christian for a long, long time, and you come to church. That is your reputation, but you're really dead, you know? And the only thing that keeps you going is people actually think you're alive, and therefore they respect you, and they honor you, and they, you're going by the reputation of people, you know? And that is what fuels you. You might serve in the MC. You might be a staff of Resonate Church. You know, you might be a former elder of another church, or you might be serving. It doesn't matter, but you have a great reputation. Jesus says, hey, you're not alive. You're actually a lie. And the most unfortunate thing about it is you're not doing anything about it. And you know what the biggest problem with that is? Just going by your reputation It means the opinion of others means more to you than the opinion of God. That's the problem. How people view you is more fulfilling and satisfying than the way that God views you. See? And you may be fooling others, but you're not fooling God. He says, I know your works. Here's the third thing. We die spiritually when we're numb to his warnings. Are you numb to his warnings? Jesus says, I know your works. And you know what a lot of us say? We say, meh. You know, oh, I know he knows, but I don't care. I don't care what he knows. He knows everything. I don't care. You know, he'll just forgive me. And do you know what that shows? That shows that you're spiritually asleep. And what you consider, you, what you consider so big, you actually consider very small in your life. Listen, my kids... When I open the garage door, and man, before I open the garage door, I pray every time. I'm like, Lord, give me the strength. Help me to love my family well. Help me to not give them my leftovers. And I gave my best at work. Help me not to give the the leftovers to my family. Help me to give my best to the family. And then the garage door opens, and before I could even park the car in the garage, My family knows all the kids rush out, no matter what they're doing, homework, eating, watching TV, they all come to greet dad. And this is what they say. They hug me and kiss me and say, daddy, how was your day? And sometimes I lie and say, it went great. But sometimes I'm honest and say, man, it was hard. I was feeling lazy. I was so tired. I was so confused. I was was bogged down with all these thoughts and I couldn't get a lot of work done that I needed to do. And they're like, man, daddy, and this is what I often hear because I coach them and I train them and I've encouraged them to do so. So they come and say, daddy, thank you for working so hard for our family. Thank you for the sacrifice. That's what they say. Because I want them to value the work that I do outside of the home so that they could have the life that they actually 
do you have? Now, for some of you, not only do you not care about the fact that he knows your works, but you don't really care about what God has done for you to liberate you from your sins. Because if you really love God, you could not say, oh, well, I know you know everything about me, but meh, you know, I know you'll forgive me. You'll instead say, Daddy, I'm sorry. I know you, I can't imagine what happened on the cross. I can't imagine to the degree that you love me, but I know you do. Thank you, thank you for working so hard. Thank you for loving me so deeply. That's what you would say. And there's no way on earth you could just rub it off and say, oh, my sin, whatever. It doesn't work that way. But for some of you, not only do you not care about the fact that he knows everything about you, but you don't care about your eternal destiny, that you take that warning, you're like, no big deal. Verse 3, it says, remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. And if you will not wake up, listen what happens. I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. He's not coming for you at that time. He's coming against you. Every time there's a reference of him being a thief in the night, did you notice a thief is like a negative reference? And when Jesus makes that reference in other parts of the Bible, he's coming to judge. He's coming to bring it down. And the tragedy of Sardis is that they all thought they were alive and they were completely unaware of their spiritual condition. And the tragedy of Resonate is the same. There are many of you who think you're alive, but you're spiritually dead. And I'm concerned for you because I love you. Matthew says, Matthew 7 says, one day not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven. Do you realize that? And do you realize that every person who says, Lord, Lord, on the day, thinks, not me. I'm alive. Every person who actually is separated from God that day, saying, Lord, Lord, thought that they were in with the Lord. And one of the indicators of this is, listen, ready? You are numb to sin. You are numb to sin. Let me ask you a question. Do you hate sin? Do you hate sin? You know, one of the most greatest, most humble plea that you can make to the Lord is not just, please forgive me. But instead, you say, Lord, please help me to hate sin. When's the last time you pray that? Help me to hate sin. Help my sin taste like vomit to me, Lord, that I may be nauseous at the very thought of grieving you, my Father, Never want to do that to you. Please help me to hate sin. Do you ever pray that? Or are you numb? And every time you say, oh, I sin, you're like, no big deal. My daddy's got a lot of cash of forgiveness. He just shells it out every time. Then you don't know your daddy. You don't know what he's done. It's like him rolling into the garage and like, you probably didn't work at all. Could I have a Porsche? That's what you and I are doing. So, what is the solution to our spiritual deadness or slumber? Three things. One, wake up. It says that in this text. Let me tell you why the warning to wake up is so fitting to the church of Sardis. You see, Sardis was actually an acropolis, which means that it was a fortified city on a hill, on the top of a hill, 1,500 feet up, high. So it was very hard to take in a battle. It had the top position, so it was strong. And nobody attacked that city, took her down, until it was conquered by the Persians and the Greeks at two separate times. Do you know how? See, Sardis had these great walls that were very tall and a huge gate that was very strong. But on the other opposite end of that gate in the city was this huge precipice, which is a rock face. And so it was so tall that every place of Sardis, every part of the wall was guarded except that precipice. So one day, when the Persians came to attack this city, they all went to the gates, and everybody fortified the inside the walls of Sardis. And yet, a group of Persian army built a ladder 
and hooked it onto that long precipice, and they climbed up the only area that was not guarded, and they went in and actually destroyed the city from inside out. That's how they took it. Now, you might think after that great historical lesson that they would never, ever do that again. And so they would guard the whole city all over, except when the Greeks came, they did the same thing. They did not learn. They did not learn from their first mistake. And this is why when Jesus says, wake up, Surely every person in that church knew exactly what they were referring to, what he was referring to. Jesus is saying, be vigilant. Assume that you're sleepy. Don't assume that you're alive when you're not. Could I tell you what it means to fall asleep spiritually? It means that Jesus is not more real to you than anything else, that other things are more real to you. Do you know why you should commit to coming to worship every single week? Because when you're in worship, Jesus actually becomes more real. The reality of Jesus becomes more real than your perceived reality. And let me give you some examples of how this works. Say you are constantly worried. You're a worry wart. And that's because Jesus' wisdom is not as real as your own. And therefore, you don't trust him. You trust your perceived view. You think you know better. You think you know how a particular circumstance in your life should go. And when you worry, you're saying, Jesus, either I think and that you don't have it, or I think you don't know what is actually good for me. This is what you think. So you're worried that Jesus might mess up over your life. But if you know that, oh, Jesus has a better view than I do. His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts higher than my thoughts, Isaiah 55. I know these things about Jesus, therefore now I can sleep and rest. He's got it better than me. You see, when his reality becomes a greater reality than your perceived reality of your own, then you rest. Let me give you another example. So you're constantly feeling guilty. You think God can't forgive you. You're constantly down on yourself. You beat yourself up. I know there are many of you here. Okay? So if you feel like God can't love you, he's punishing you after all, he sees all of our sins, so you beat yourself up all the time, and that means, listen, your sins are more real to you than Jesus' death for your sins. The utter reality of Jesus' death for your sins should be more real than your perceived sins, I mean, perceived thoughts of Oh, man, my sins are real. Oh, they are real, but what's even more real is Jesus' death over those sins. Amen? And if those things are more real to you, then it would appease your guilt to know that his salvation, his cross, his life, he says, to telestai, meaning it is finished, it is done once and for all. See? And for those of you who are constantly feeling guilty, 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 you know, I don't know how many many times I've said this, but I say, Jesus loves you. Do you believe that? And you say, well, I believe that, but it doesn't help. Do you know what you're like then? You're like that somebody who says, yeah, yeah, my house is on fire. You know, wake me up in the morning. See, that means you're asleep. But if you really knew how much Jesus loved you, then you wouldn't say that. The perceived reality is dominating the utter reality of Jesus' love over you. I'll give you one more. Some of you are having trouble with sharing the gospel. See, but a lot of you don't share the gospel because you don't think your friends need it. Not, not because you, don't, you think your friends don't need it. Not because you don't think hell is real. I really do think that you think hell is real. I really do think that you know, you know that Jesus, I mean, they need Jesus. But here's the reason why most of us don't share the gospel with others. Because... Their opinion of you matters more than God's opinion of you. And you're afraid to share the gospel because if you do, then it might offend them and it might alienate them. And, and so you're, you want to be liked so desperately. And yet when you're awake, you'll see that what Jesus thinks of you matters so much more than what they think of you. And therefore, waking up means that You use every means at your disposal, not only your prayer, not only your reading of scripture, not only being a part of MCs, attending worship, giving, serving, loving others in the city, 
And by doing those things, Jesus actually becomes more real. And we should be vigilant over this so that we might not fall asleep. Here's the second thing that we must do. First, wake up. But secondly, strengthen your gospel conviction. And we see this in verse 2. It says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. And of course, we established already that what is about to die is the love for the gospel. And it's confirmed in verse 4. Yet, you have still a few names of Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white. Walk with me in white. What is that? For they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. Now, here's another picture, white garments. What are they? Well, if you look through the uh, book of Revelation, you, you realize that that is referring to purity. But it also says uh, they are white because they are worthy. Worthy. Now, interestingly, in the next two chapters of Revelation, you'll see this word worthy used six times. And all six times, it's referring to Jesus being worthy. Except this time. This one time when this worthiness is attributed to the people in Sardis and us. And what is Jesus referring to here? I'll tell you what it is. Jesus is saying, these worthy people are not people who've lived a perfect life. Not saying that they haven't soiled their garments and they will be in white garments forever. Because what? Look at the tense. It says they will, okay, uh, walk in white. What tense is that? <laughs> future tense future tense how how does jesus know how does he know that they're going to actually live worthy how does he know that they're going to remain worthy ah because the worthiness of christ will fall on them it won't be the worthiness of their own that's why jesus knows he knows fully to the certainty that they will be covered in white. What does it say in that verse? It says they will be clothed in white. They don't say they wear white. No, they will be clothed. They will be given this whiteness. And where does that whiteness come from? From the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, living the life that you and I couldn't live. And now that white robe goes over you, and now you all of a sudden not become worthy, but are given worthiness. This is how Jesus knows that you're going to be worthy in the end. And to the same degree you understand that gospel, and the same degree that you know that you are not deserving of it, is to the same degree you say, God, I don't want to sin against that kind of God. Man, can you believe today I stand as one of those who actually wear a garment that is not soiled? You know how much I soil my garments every single day? In fact, Isaiah 64 says, all our righteousness are filthy rags. It doesn't say all of our sins are filthy rags. It says all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. It's to say that even our good compares nothing to the good of our Jesus. Our righteousness are like filthy rags compared to his holiness is what it's saying. My goodness, how righteous is he? So how dare I be so arrogant as to say, I'm worthy. I'll never say that. The only reason why I'm worthy, the only reason why few people in Sardis was worthy was because they've been clothed in white. They've been given worthiness because Jesus himself was only worthy. And the reason why Christ was so confident that they will walk with him in white, because listen, not only does Christ save you, but he also keeps you. Thank you, Lord. That not only does he save you and says, you're all up to your own now. Good luck. No, he says, you come into my family and you're never leaving. Do you realize that his grips over you is stronger than your grips of your own? That when you let go of Christ, he will never let go of you, no matter what happens. You see, not only is he good to save you, but he is good to save you. Praise God for that. <laughs> Praise God for that. Here's number three. You must repent then. 
you must repent. Verse 3, remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. 500 years ago, Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg door. My wife and I went last year and just amazing to see. You know, he wanted to debate the selling of indulgences of his fellow university professors. They were selling indulgences for the forgiveness of sins, and Martin Luther knew that only God had the right to do that. And he did. He sent his son. You know, so the very first words of the 95 Thesis, it says this, all of life is repentance. All of life. 30 years after that, would be his final words written on a piece of paper. 30 years after he wrote on the Wittenberg door, and he says the same thing. He says, we are beggars. That is true. He says, we're all beggars at the foot of the cross, and our filth is washed away by his lavish grace. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us cleanse us from our unrighteousness, cleanse us to give us garments that are snow. And so we're going to close our service a little differently. We're going to close our time in a time of repentance. And I know this is not the normal rhythm of Resonate, but it should. And if you're new to Resonate Church, you're like, oh my gosh, this church is weird. I haven't done this since my Catholic upbringing. Listen, you're not repenting to me. I have no indulgences to sell to you. But I only have the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And I could just point him to you. That's all. And the utter reality is that if you confess your sins, he will receive you today. There's some of you who are not just sleepy spiritually, but actually dead spiritually. It means you're not a Christian. And if you cry out to him today, he will receive you too. It sounds too simple. You see, what repentance is, is not driving you to guilt or you don't have to be depressed about yourself. What repentance is, is freedom. It's freedom to liberate you from the bondage of the sin that you are in. Stop washing the outside cup. Time to wash the inside, inside of your soul. So will you bow your heads with me? Let's go to God. And I want to give you a moment to just pray to the Lord. And maybe perhaps the Lord is leading you to repent of a particular sin. That you have to say, God, I confess that I've loved your grace more than my desire to obey you. Maybe you need to confess your worries, believing that you know better than God. Maybe perhaps you need to repent of your comfort making your will greater than God's will. Maybe you need to repent this morning that you need to, you have not joined the gospel word. Not because you don't think that the world needs the gospel, but you're so consumed by the opinion of others greater than God's opinion of you. So if the spirit lives in you, I pray that it would speak to you. And for those of you who are spiritually dead and who are not Christians, Today is the day for salvation. Today is the day for salvation. We just cry out to him and say, would you please receive me? And then on the other end, you'll see the scriptures cry out, the Holy Spirit speaking to you to say, yes, you will be with me in paradise. Would you pray? Father, we come knowing that you see them all. You have the fullness of God in you. You see to the very bottom of our life. And Father, long before we look like we have cancer, 
there could be a cancer in us that could be eating us away. There could be a sin that could be devouring up our souls. And Father, we come to you today clean and to say, will you forgive us? Will you help us to believe that it's true? Will you help us to believe that you are that loving and that powerful? Even to the degree that you would help us to hate that sin. That you would give us a new affection for yourself as we look upon the cross. And that we would no longer want to hurt you as we've hurt you in the past. Not that we're in the bondage of sin, but now we're in the bondage of love. The love that is in you, Christ, towards us. And now we want to love you back. So cleanse us now and renew us afresh. And we pray that we be people of God that doesn't have the reputation of being alive, but actually is alive because you live in us. We pray in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, all God's people said, amen. Let's give him glory this morning.